Four years after the end of the Second World War, 20th Century Fox released the movie Twelve O'Clock High. This film, starring Gregory Peck, won acclaim for its authenticity and is now recognized as the best dramatic portrayal of the 8th Air Force's bomber offensive. In the opening scene, the former adjutant of a bomber station returns to his wartime haunts. The airfield now deserted and returned to agriculture. This moving opening was actually shot in Alabama, not England. But with remarkable foresight, Hollywood was preempting history. For in years to come, in ever-increasing numbers, the survivors of that air war would return to view crumbling buildings, pace weedy runways, to reminisce, and perhaps shed a tear. For an airman cannot return to battlefields in the sky, and the old airfield base becomes the focal point of his memories. Now, a half century on, these old airfield sites have become precious places to United States Army Air Force veterans. To them, little bits of old England that are forever America. And there are many such places in England. For during the war, the United States assembled, in terms of men and machines, the two largest air forces in history, which at one time or another, during the period 1942 to 45, occupied some 150 different airfields, mostly in south and southeastern counties. To most people, their names are just towns and villages on a map. But for the veterans of the air war fought over the Nazi empire, they have a very special significance. Alconbury, Glatton. Polebrook, Deanthorpe, Kingscliff, Grafton Underwood. Grafton Underwood. It was from this Northamptonshire airfield that the first 8th Air Force heavy bomber mission was flown on the 17th of August 1942, when 12 B-17 fortresses took off to bomb the rail marshalling yards at Rouen. Brigadier General Ira Eker, commander of 8th Bomber Command, was aboard one of the aircraft all of which returned safely. From this small beginning, the 8th Air Force grew to where it was able to launch 3,000 bombers and fighters on a single day's operations. The main weapon of the 8th was the heavy bomber, the fortress and the liberator. In the early days, there were eight heavies to a squadron, later twice that number, and four squadrons made up a group, the chief operational organization. That is, operations were conducted on a group basis, not by its squadrons. Each airfield was occupied by one group, most remaining in residence for the duration of hostilities. The first group, the 97th, did not stay at Grafton Underwood for many weeks, being transferred to the 12th Air Force and sent to support the North African invasion forces late in 1942. This airfield, often called Grafton Under Mud by those stationed there, received the 384th Bomb Group in May 1943 and this unit remained for two years, flying 314 combat missions. The 384th Air Crew Briefing Session for a mission to attack an aircraft factory at Anklam in October 1943. Typical of pre-mission preparations. It'll show him that we will seek out his industry and destroy it wherever he places it. Trucks deliver the crews to bombers, parked on hard stands, dispersed against a backdrop of woodland, from which the parish in which the airfield was built got its name. Ten young men prepare to put their trust in Reno's raiders. B-17s wait in line on the perimeter track near the gun test part, ready to take their turn on the main runway. Takeoffs to the northeast at 30 to 45 second intervals. Each a tense time for the crews, who knew that a faltering or failing engine would precipitate a crash of the overloaded bomber. The intense activity this place once knew 
had no more check on time than ripples can mark a puddle. A half century on, little remains of this famous airfield from which the first and last 8th Air Force heavy bomber missions were dispatched. The familiar backdrop of old Headwood is still to be seen. But Reno's radar and the other fortresses that once stood stoically nearby are now a memory. The gun test butt stands festooned with scrub, and this fence track is all that is left of the main runway, where fortresses once strained to lift their loads skywards. A public road, closed when the airfield was built, has been reopened, and a memorial to the American airmen who served at Grafton Underwood now stands where this road crosses the path of the main runway. And what of the villagers? Those who have cause to remember best were the little children of the war years. Quentin Bland was one. As we all know, sweets were rationed during the war, and uh, my father had to cycle through the airfield twice a day to his work, and obviously got to know the MPs quite well on the gates. And two of them, who turned out to be brothers actually, used to save their sweet ration for me. And my father would take me to the guardroom every Sunday morning and collect the sweet ration that they had and any others that they'd been able to get off any of their colleagues. So really for me, it was quite a luxury. Most of the concrete on Grafton Underwood's 500 acres, part of the Duke of Buccleuch's estate, has been uprooted and the land long returned to agriculture. Not so Molesworth just 10 miles away in Huntingdonshire, and another base occupied by the 8th Air Force for over three years. Enlarged in the early 1950s, during the height of the Cold War threat, there was a United States Air Force presence for two decades, but mostly with a standby status. Then, in the early 1980s, Molesworth was selected for development as the second cruise missile site in the UK. Massive construction of protected shelters and control facilities followed, and in 1988, the first Tomahawks with nuclear capability arrived. Their stay was short-lived, for an arms agreement with the Soviets saw the scrapping of all cruise missiles begin a year later, and Molesworth returned to a passive state, the watchtower and bunkers now deserted. The organization operating the cruise missiles was the 303rd Tactical Missile Wing, lineal successor to the 303rd Bomb Group, which flew B-17 fortresses from Molesworth from September 1942 to June 1945. The pair of T-2 and single J-type wartime hangars that served the 303rd in World War II remain, but there is little left of the utility buildings and concrete aircraft dispersal points. Discarded trappings of the Cold War litter the site where once B-17s held sway. Does the ghost of old Mispa still linger here? as mechanics work through the night to get it ready for a mission. Can the echoes of four score right cyclones under test be heard before cockcrow? The bomb loading was usually done in the dark hours, a time-consuming task, each bomb having to be carefully wound up into the bay by a cable hoist. Between two and six thousand pounds of bombs were put into each fortress, depending on the distance to be flown. With full fuel load, two and a half thousand US gallons, and other requirements for a combat mission, each B-17 carried some 25,000 pounds into the air in addition to its own weight. Cab rank on the perimeter track. Hangars on the right. Forts roll by the Molesworth control tower. There's knockout dropper, the first to fly 50 missions. And here comes Hell's Angels, the bomber from which the 303rd took its popular name. Take off to the west on the 6,090 foot long main runway. Pass the hangars and a turn into the circuit. On average, it took around two hours to get a whole group of 30 bombers airborne and into formation at the desired departure altitude. Close formation was essential for good defense, massing as many guns as possible to present a formidable hail of fire against any enemy fighter approach. The 303rd flew really tight formations, no easy job in turbulence. Pilots truly had to work at the controls.
The fortress's running mate, the B-24 Liberator, was less stable at high altitudes and required greater effort from the pilots to maintain position in formation. Liberator pilots claimed theirs was a real man's aircraft. This is a pretty tight B-24 formation of the 44th Bomb Group, the Flying Gate Balls, the first group in the USA AF to be equipped with the aircraft and one of the first to bring it to the UK. The 44th was based at Shipton, 14 miles west of Norwich, and like all bomb groups, had its share of tough missions. Shot up by fighters during a raid on Munster's rail yards, a B-24 named Peepsight lands with number four engine out and a flat tire. Both her pilots and four of the other eight men on board were wounded. The ground loop clearly frightened a member of Shipton's indigenous inhabitants. Ragged holes in the wing and fuselage where cannon shells exploded. Peepsight made it home, but more than 120 of the Liberators that set out on 320 missions flown from this airfield did not. Later the same month of the Peepsight incident, November 1943, another Shipton B-24 was badly damaged by fighter attack during a mission to Norway. On return, only one main undercarriage leg would lower and became jammed down. A one-wheel landing with a B-24 was so dangerous that the captain, Lieutenant Griffith, ordered his crew to bail out. But one gunner had been badly wounded in the combat and could not parachute. So Griffith and his co-pilot had to attempt a landing. The result was one of the most spectacular crash landings ever filmed. Today, crops flourish where this B-24 came to rest. But aircraft still fly from Shipton. In the 1960s, Arrow Air Services, a small charter firm, started operating from the northern part of the airfield. The wartime hangars still stand on the technical site, used by haulage and construction companies. The control tower from which this sweep was filmed is being renovated for possible use as a museum. Another one-time Liberator base has become the production centre for Lotus Cars, now part of General Motors Corporation. The old wartime technical site has been developed into a factory complex. Few of the original buildings survive, although there is a noticeable exception on what was a communal site. A time-battered recreational hall, now used as a cattle shelter, stands forlorn. But on an inside wall, a mural remains, near as bright as the day it was painted. This wants back the altar of an improvised chapel. Men worshipped here before going off to battle. How many who would not return gaze through these windows. Part of the runway and perimeter track layout at Hefley has been retained and is used as a test track for the company's sports cars. Elans whiz around the circuit at 150 miles an hour. Even so, the view from the control tower today cannot compare with the spectacle of the spring of 44. The first plane off runway 24, with 6,000 pounds of high explosive, to deliver to the Ruhr. There goes the Green Dragon, the yellow and green stripe assembly ship used to gather a formation. 25 more libs to launch. It took 20 minutes to get the whole force into the air. After a raid on Ham in April 1944, Luftwaffe fighters took advantage of nightfall to follow Liberator formations to their bases and shoot some down as they prepared to land. One B-24 crashed into the radar hut, killing the occupants 
but the air crew managed to escape. Seen from the control tower next morning, there was not a lot left of what had once been a shiny new Liberator. The 389th Bomb Group at Hethel was part of the 2nd Air Division, which had 15 airfields around Norwich, mostly to the south and west. When the boys weren't flying, Norwich was the magnet. Places like the Samson and Hercules Ballroom, where there were girls. And the girls certainly haven't forgotten the boys. This is the Samson and Hercules, the mecca in those dreadful war years in Norwich, the mecca for us girls to come and meet those gorgeous American boys. They were so lovely in their uniforms and their manners were so perfect. We just loved them all. Well, I used to take all, all the Americans home to meet my mother. Well, this one particular one, he was really nice, but after the evening had finished, he was asking my mother out. <laughs> six, weeks, six weeks later, he asked her to marry him, and he didn't like it because I used to call him daddy. But she said no, and I thought I was going to be a GI baby. <laughs> oh, please, yeah. please explain to Joy that uh, your mother was a young widow. Oh, yes. oh, my mother was a widow, <laughs> oh, and she was young. Oh, we couldn't have wished for anything better. We could, we could live on our memories. Oh, we really definitely. Could. Do you remember when they first came here? And uh, we were 16, 17, and they brought magic oh. with them, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. Norwich was so dull before they came, and oh, magic well, The war had started. been going on for years, and every people were a bit depressed. Yeah. And they came on the scene, and the whole place started jumping. Oh, didn't it? It, yes, did it really jump? They did, didn't it? All <laughs> night, every night. Oh, it was marvelous. And daytimes too. Uh, yeah. We couldn't walk down the street without um, you remember. And the well, without being surrounded by these right. friendly boys. The officers' yeah. pink pants. Well, you oh, saw them for and, miles. And didn't the you? the crushed hats. hats. Oh, the they never wore mission, them straight, did yeah, they? The yeah, the hundred mission yeah. crushed hats. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way they treated us. We were all special. Well, we were ladies. We were really weren't special. We? Made to feel ladies. Well, I had uh, a bit of hair falling in my eyes. Yeah. And uh, they used to say, oh, look, here comes little Veronica Lake. One day... And, of course, similar sentiments are voiced by ladies up and down the land, even by one of the most famous songsters of the time. Yes, I mean, they did add a bit of colour to the, to the lives of the girls. So many of our chaps were away, you see. And, of course, there were... Very, men were very short on the ground, as it were, and, uh, and they came with a lot of life and different attitude, and, and I'm sure they were very surprised at, at us, because 50 years ago we were a little bit behind the times compared with the, the Americans, and um, so they, they brought a bit of life to the, uh, to the little villages especially. Today, some former bomber bases have become places of entertainment. This pool, with its bathing bells and tropical atmosphere, exists plumb in the middle of Earl's Cone Airfield, southwest of Colchester. Part of a leisure centre with gymnasium, games rooms and restaurant surrounded by two 18-hole golf courses. There is also a private airstrip. An incongruous scene. A very English skyline with the spire of Greenstead Green Church as a yak with Soviet insignia taxes past golf bunkers. The Russian-built aircraft is one of the more noticeable residents. One of the many Earl's Cone Cessnas tests a blustery morn. The turf strip is along the line of the long-removed northeast-southwest concrete runway. Hard Luxor. Now hidden behind a large reservoir, the wartime control tower has become a residence and sprouts chimneys. Earl's Cone, like all bomber bases used by the 8th and 9th Air Forces, was built to British Air Ministry Class A standard, with three intersecting concrete runways. Two 4,200 feet long and the main 6,000 feet. The whole circled by a taxiway some three and a half miles in length. Only part of the main runway remains as a road. In 1942, when the airfield was built, bulldozers flattened the area. In 1990, bulldozers were busy reversing the scene. For much of its operational use, 
Earl's Cone housed the 323rd bomb group, which flew B-26 marauders, here landing on the main runway from the south. These twin-engine medium bombers did not have the range of the B-17s and B-24s, and most of their missions were directed against enemy airfields and communications targets in the Low Countries and northern France. An advanced design with a high landing speed, the Marauder acquired a bad reputation when first introduced into service. However, it acquitted itself well over Europe with a low loss rate and high durability, while its crews achieved a record for some of the most accurate bombing. The Marauder also packed a lot of guns, as exhibited here on the Utah Gamecock. Like the majority of American warplanes, Earl's Colm Marauders carried individual nicknames and motifs. It is a long time since Earl's Cone echoed to the song of double wasp engines and farm horses worked the fields. The eight marauder groups of the 9th Air Force were all based in Essex County, as were its three A-20 Havoc Light Bomb groups. The A-20s of the 416th Bomb Group at Wethersfield were the first in action and employed similar tactics to the marauders tight formations and drop-on leader bombing. Much as the forts and libs, but at a far lower altitude, 10,000 to 14,000 feet. The gang moves out past number two hangar. Silent and deserted, the hangar and hard stands remain, little changed, a half century on. The 416th flew over a hundred missions from Wethersfield in six months, each a major effort for the ground men who amounted to 85% of the personnel. Trucking bombs was hard and tricky work. Each bay usually held four 500 or eight 250 pounders, carefully winched up to the retaining shackles. Fuses are fitted. Machine guns cleaned, barrels rotted. Perspex polished. Nothing must mar the bombardier's vision. The Havoc was a nimble aircraft and had a crew of three or four. A bearded flyer was very rare in the USA AF. With no need to use an oxygen mask, it was permissible and possible. Flak suits, the lightweight body armor, go on. Another departure.
This is Weathersfield today. Another return. This one was rough, plenty of flak holes. Weathersfield was another typical wartime airfield with accommodation for 3,000 on eight sites dispersed in nearby countryside. The huts were mostly missiles. Similar living sites were to be found at most USA AF stations. In post-war years, Weathersfield became one of the major USAF fighter bases with a NATO role. After Thunder Jets and Super Sabres, the base was put on standby status and occupied by a Red Horse unit, the name given to a quick reaction airfield repair organization. The original control tower supports post-war embellishments and a tree has been allowed to grow close by. Like most wartime airfields to Class A standard that were later used for jet aircraft, Weathersfield had an extension of the original main runway. Although built primarily for multi-engine aircraft use, several Class A airfields were occupied by American fighters. Boxted near Colchester was one. The first Merlin engine Mustangs operated from here in the winter of 1943-44. Ding Heo, Lieutenant Colonel James Howard's personal Mustang in which he won the only Medal of Honor, the highest US decoration awarded to a fighter pilot flying over Europe. He won this for a loan driving off enemy aircraft attacking a fortress formation. The 9th Air Force's 354th fighter group was the outfit equipped with the first P-51Bs, which, because of their excellent performance and outstanding range, were initially employed to escort 8th Air Force heavy bombers. These takeoffs are to the southwest on runway 28, number two hangar in the background. Mustangs landing over Dedham Birchwood on the same runway. By the end of the war, one of the 354th squadrons was credited with having destroyed more enemy aircraft in combat than any other squadron in the whole USAAF. Today, the Birchwood looks much the same but there's little to show there was ever an airfield here when viewed from near the same spot where the Mustangs were filmed. A line of pollarded poplars marks the line of the removed runway. Another row, the main runway, the concrete long gone to be used for the foundations of new highways. When the Mustangs moved out, the 8th Air Force's 56 fighter group moved in. The 56 was the first to fly the big P-47 Thunderbolt and became the top scoring US fighter group in air combat with the Luftwaffe. Among the many ace pilots who served with the 56th were the two top scorers in the European theater of operations, Francis Gabreski and Robert S. Johnson. 
each with 28 air victories. The CO, Colonel David Schilling, an ace with 22 victories at his aircraft, ready to lead a mission. These Thunderbolts are taking off from runway 28. Number one hangar and the technical site are in the background. The hangar in which Glenn Miller and his band once played is now long gone, replaced by an agricultural merchant's office building. Many Romney and Nissan technical site buildings remain and are used by small engineering firms. The old squadron crew rooms. The 9th Air Force made extensive use of a P-47 as a fighter bomber for supporting the ground forces during the invasion of the continent. The 56th was the only fighter group to retain the Thunderbolt in England. The other 14 fighter groups of the 8th Air Force having re-equipped with P-51 Mustangs before the end of hostilities. The most famous Mustang group was the 4th, based at Debden near Saffron Walden. Formed in 1942 from the RAF's three Eagle squadrons, manned by American volunteer pilots, the 4th's total claims of enemy aircraft destroyed in the air and by ground strafing were the highest of any group in the whole USAAF. However, its losses were also a record high due in part to the group's long period of action. Ed Ritchie was an engineering officer at Debden for two and a half years. The place holds many memories for him, not least coming to terms with British habits. I'm standing here in the hangar at Debden, that one remaining hangar of three, and I'm being flooded with memories. One of the first memories is early in 1943 when I walked into the hangar to see what was going on. The RAF were still here, and I found out that the war stopped for tea because someone yelled, tea time, and every spanner dropped on the hangar floor. They all ran out to the tea cart. Debden was a pre-war RAF station with centrally heated brick and tile barracks which made the buildings on wartime built airfields seem decidedly primitive. Like several other stations with permanent buildings and facilities, when finally abandoned by the RAF, they were taken over by the army. In 1977, Debden became the base of an armoured regiment and currently the 16 5th Queen's Royal Lancers are resident. The runways are still intact and in good condition. This is 28, looking southwest. The barns near Abbott's farm remain a prominent landmark. Honington is another pre-war built RAF station turned over to the Americans during the Second World War. However, this airfield has been retained by the RAF and for much of the latter part of this century has been an important strike command base. Tornado GR1 squadrons were resident in 1992. The runway was put down post-war, for while the original wartime plan was to make Huntington an 8th Air Force bomber base, paved runway construction was never completed, and the station became the main overhaul depot for fortresses of the 3rd Air Division.
The C-type hangars looked much the same in World War II as they do a half century on. B-17s that through battle damage or mechanical failure could not lower their landing gear were often directed to crash land at Honington, where repairs could be more easily affected. This one has only one main leg down. A brand new fort, in trouble, comes in from the northeast for a crash landing. The under turret has been jettisoned, as it would otherwise be crushed into the fuselage and cause irreparable damage. A smooth touchdown against a backdrop of woods. The navigator cut his head when pitched against a projection by the impact. Bent propellers, ripped skin, but otherwise little hurt. Raised, repaired and put back in service, this B-17G went missing in action with the 100th bomb group at Thorpe Abbotts a few weeks later. Perhaps not so dramatic, Honington still sees the occasional emergency. This tornado has a nose wheel that wouldn't retract. But will it collapse on touchdown? The arrestor hook is lowered to catch the check line. Broomhill Wood and Taylor's Grove still dominate Honington's northeast skyline. In 1944, Honington was also home to the 364th Fighter Group. This outfit was initially equipped with P-38 Lightnings, which proved unsuitable for long-range escort over Europe due to dive limitations and engine problems at high altitudes. A visually striking aircraft with distinctive twin-boom fuselages was easily recognized and because of this was employed to patrol over the invasion beaches and bridgehead in June 1944. The 364th converted to Mustangs in the summer of 1944. During conversion, a pilot lost control of his Mustang, which veered off the track, sliced the tail of a fortress and ended a flaming wreck. With ammunition exploding, a dangerous job for the firefighters. Fighter planes and their pilots were often in the limelight during wartime. At the other end of the military aircraft spectrum were the transports, which received little publicity. Most of their work involved hauling supplies and people with the occasional combat venture, dropping paratroops or supporting airborne landings. There were 20 USAAF transport bases in the UK, 15 serving troop carrier command whose workhorse was the C-47 Skytrain, or Dakota, to use the more popular British name for what was originally the Douglas DC-3 airliner. One long-time C-47 base was Aldermaston in Berkshire, home of the 315th Troop Carrier Group from December 1942, and in 1944, the 434th Troop Carrier Group.
These are C-47s at Aldermaston and paratroops of the 101st Airborne Division about to board for Operation Market, the air invasion of Holland in 1944. Wax and Red Cross girls kiss the boys goodbye, perhaps a stunt for the camera. On two of the three missions for this operation, the 434th towed WACO CG-4A gliders, here marshalled at Aldermaston. Twelve of the group C-47s were shot down and 70 damaged by flak. After the war, Aldermaston was selected as a site for the atomic weapons establishment. Over the years, an extensive complex of buildings has developed and it is generally a prohibited area. At many former American wartime airfields, the old control towers have been turned into museums by enthusiasts for the history of these places. One of the best is at Framlingham, Suffolk, where there is talk of a haunting. Leroy Keeping, an armament mechanic at the wartime base and now a local resident who helps at the museum. Well, there have been incidents where uh, one or two people have been working out here. They've smelt cigar smoke. There's nobody around. Another fellow heard footsteps. He investigated and there was nobody else about. And we have had visitors, especially upstairs in the control tower, that uh, say they can feel a presence there. Another fine control tower museum at Thorpe Abbott's Norfolk also has tales of a ghost. Several people who run the Thorpe Abbott's Museum were youngsters when fortress squadrons occupied the airfield and can remind you that they were sometimes dangerous places to be around. Probably the nearest squeak that I had personally was uh, an incident which happened when uh, a ball turret gunner was taking the um, guns out of his turret to be cleaned. Something went wrong and one gun started to fire and the single gun rotated the turret and sprayed the whole area with, with bullets. I was standing about half a mile away, but the bullets were whistling over my head. And I wasn't frightened particularly because it happened, uh, I didn't quite realize what was going on and it was over and done with before the penny had dropped that they were real life bullets going overhead. But it, was, it could have been nasty, there could have been a lot of injuries and, and uh, the only injuries were to actually the gunner himself who was killed. Many and varied are the uses to which old airfields have been put in the years following the Second World War. Racing tracks, sports fields, prisons, factories and more. But the most typical form of development is like that at Bury St Edmunds. The old hangars and buildings on the former technical site have been adapted for industrial and commercial use, with new structures added. Traffic hums on the busy A45, but passers-by are unlikely to recognize this as once being an airfield, unless they spot the hangar nestling among the trees. The Eldo cottages once stood within the airfield perimeter track. However, in one corner of Bury St Edmunds stands a very notable reminder. A pub named after the bombers that once thundered off runways nearby, but are there no more. One can sip a pint, and soak up the memorabilia. The building was originally a private house, taken over when the airfield was constructed and used by the Americans as an engineering office and store. The pub sign by the road features one of the 94th Bomb Group's most famous fortresses, Frenesi.
During a mission to Brunswick in January 1944, this B-17 received repeated attacks from enemy fighters. Six men bailed out when they thought the bomber was out of control and doomed. But despite an inoperative engine and extraordinary battle damage, pilots Bill Cayley and Jabez Churchill brought Frenese home to Berry and Hardstand 11. The concrete that was Hardstand 11 has gone and wheat grows in reclaimed soil. The oaks that stood nearby still stand, now encroached by industrial development. For the American airmen, even though their service at these airfields was but a brief time frame in their lives, they were places of such intense activity and, to the flyers in particular, associated with the most extraordinary experiences that they now have an almost hallowed status. One of these very English names, like Attlebridge, Defham Green, Barkerston Heath, Bungay, Chipping Ongar, Gosfield, Greenham Common, Little Walden, Ridgewell, Stony Cross, Steeple Morden, and four score more will always hold a special place for some USAAF veteran. Perhaps only they can truly express these feelings. Hard really to put it in words. Almost like another home. One of the boys was very close to me. Bob would say he's well nearly like a brother. Because we used to argue, but I thought this is all brothers argue. And me and this chap did, but that didn't make any difference. But this particular chap I was talking about. I can go where he used to walk and stand, and I can, I can, I can see him there, you know, in my mind. Because he was a fairly big man. And I often think about him. You know, places like that, you never blot them out. They're always there. Every time I come back to England and stay on the end of this runway, it brings back memories of the many missions I flew here. How lucky I am to be a survivor. I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm still here to come back and visit these airfields. Flying crews that we trained with back in the state, there was only about a quarter of them that, you know, came through all their missions. So it means a great deal to me. And memories come flooding back, some good, some bad. But all in all, it's a good memory. Well, you have to realize that this was the greatest period of our life. We had so much life and excitement crammed into a couple of years. And that was where we really grew up. And when I think of anything now, looking back, the day before yesterday is very hazy, but I can remember everything about Debden. And it was really our home. I look on Debden as my home because that's where I grew up. That's where I became a man. That's where I had all the excitement. That's where all my buddies were. And a lot of them are still there. Thank <laughs> you.